a computer system. So the traditional techniques are duplex, where you have two copies of ta task running on two cores, or you have the triple modular redundancy, where you have three computers running the same software, and then you have a majority voter that determines which one is correct. And otherwise, in other words, if two of them have identical results, you then declare this is the correct one, and this way you can mask a fault in the circle. This uh, has been shown to be not a very effective technique. First of all, you have a voter, a single voter, which becomes a single point of failure. If something goes wrong in the voter, it doesn't matter if all three of them work flawlessly, you'll get the wrong result. Secondly, if you have a processor here that has a fault, a memory here that has a flip bit, and maybe a software bug here, all of them will not operate properly. So a better way is to split the logic here into two or more sections, have the processors on one hand, the memories on the other hand, and have now three voters. So in this organization, you may have a, memo a faulty memory, a faulty processor, and a faulty voter, and still the system works properly because the majority of the signals are correct. And let's see an example of how this technique has been used in the early design of the Boeing 777, which is definitely a good example of a life critical cyber-physical system. As you can see here, the logic has been separated, partitioned into three sections. And you have two sets of three voters between them. So in this way, you can have a faulty unit here, a faulty voter here, another faulty unit here, another faulty voter here, another faulty unit here, and you can still operate properly. Uh, maybe I'll go back just one slide. Uh, let me also mention here that this is a, a very high level of redundancy, and one of the objectives that the point designer had in mind is not only to make sure that the flight will pass with no fault to, uh, to the destination, they wanted also to, if possible, to delay maintenance. They don't want, if in the middle of the flight, they have a fault, they don't want to have to land down immediately because they are no longer safe. So they have more redundancy that is absolutely needed so they can delay the maintenance until they reach the destination. Okay, so what is our approach? We don't want to use this massive type of redundancy that an airplane can afford. It's more than 300 uh, redundancy. We would like to reduce the redundancy in order to be able to use it for smaller and uh, better operated type of cyber physical systems. So what we are using is planned state-based adaptive fault tolerance. In other words, if we decide that currently our plant is very deep in the safe region, it can withstand some erroneous control inputs, so we'll not do anything, basically. We will hope that the next time around, the control input will be correct. <coughs> Why aren't we concerned? Because a single event upset or transient faults occur naturally, particle heat and so on, and usually they come and go, and that's it. So if that's the case, we don't have to do anything, we don't have to apply any countermeasures, the system will take care of itself. However, if we are in a marginal state, we will need to apply some more serious uh, approaches. So, uh, in order to follow this approach, what we need is first of all a well-defined safe region, and more importantly, we need to know how to determine whether the plant is deep in the safe region and we can sort of relax, we don't have to apply too heavy countermeasures. So we need a couple of definitions. So the first one we define is what we call the safe state space or S cubed. 
and this would be a subspace of all the potential, all the possible states on the, on the cyber-physical system, which meet the safety space constraints, as we have seen examples before, and we'll see more examples in a couple of slides. So we will say that the point is in that safe space, uh, safe space if, first of all, it satisfies the constraints at this time, and based on those conditions that we'll see in a minute, it will continue to satisfy those constraints, the impact of the operating environment. And we'll see an example in a few slides. So let's go back to our typical example, the inverted tender room, and see how this, subs, this safe space looks like. So what we see at the top, we see the self, the red one is a complete uh, S cube. And if the period of applying the control task is 10 milliseconds, you can see it's very large. But if you apply a new control only every 30 milliseconds, many bad things can get and can happen in between, the inverted tender who can go out of whack and go, uh, fall down, so you might be too late. It means that the safe space is much smaller. And let's look at uh, the two diagrams below. That's uh, found on the action. What is the maximum force that can be applied to the cow that moves right and left in order to uh, get the pendulum back into the vertical position? If you are limited to 2.5 Newton, we have a very narrow safe space. But if you have a larger force that you can apply, you increase the space. It's sort of is very long. So let's define now, let's break down this S cubed into subspaces. And we'll call them S1, S2, and S3. S1 is the innermost portion of the state space. This is where it's completely safe, which means it will be mathematically defined even if you apply the worst case control input for one iteration, the plant will not leave the same space. Nothing wrong will happen. S2, or let's go to S3. S3, if the controller produces an incorrect output, the plant is not guaranteed to stay straight. You don't know this is what we call the it can basically break uh, the system, the tender will go uh, down, the airplane will go down, and all kinds of unpleasant um, things can happen. And S2 is somewhere in between. That's if the controller generates a default output going or side channel attacks. So let's see what are the corresponding vulnerabilities. We have, since we are connected to the network, we can experience intrusions in the network. We can experience information set of the IP that we have there. And what might be more relevant here, we, can, uh, we are vulnerable to modifying the software, either an injection malicious code or reprogramming the tasks and the control tasks that we have. So, our approach relies on making a distinction between two types of malicious uh, faults or two of different objectives of the attacker. One is, one and the most important one that we'll uh, concentrate on is harming the physical plant operation. Let's see what's the second one, and then we'll understand better what the meaning in the first one. The second one is stealing proprietary information. That's the most common one we would like to get either the IP of the software or to get some information that is private to the user. We are more concerned, since it's a cyber-physical system and we have a physical component, we are more concerned about the first one, where the intent of the hacker is to stop the, our car in the middle of the highway or 
accelerate it in a small street or bring down the airplane or stop the uh, hands uh, monitoring device and so on. That's our main concern. That would be our focus. For the second one, there are quite a few uh, uh, known, uh, this is a well known set, and there are quite a few techniques, usually through some cryptography, to protect against. It. Now, if we go to the first one, the threats to the physical plant can be in principle detected, for, for example, by intrusion detection, by using code analyzer, normally detection, sandboxing, and so on. Unfortunately, those techniques that have been developed have a very high overhead. What might be even more relevant or more important here is that they never achieve 100% coverage because you install your countermeasure, but the hacker is not sitting idle, they are developing new attacks, and for which you haven't developed countermeasures, so you have to update it continuously, and usually you are chasing the, the hacker, he is always in front of you. What we would like to come up with an approach that will be independent of the attack that the hacker has in mind. So, what is uh, the approach that we follow? The most first, the most important step is to detect the threat. We, we know that we're under attack. If we are capable of recovering it, that's very nice, but not always it's possible. So, in such case, we'll have to inform the operator or some remote uh, control that we are under attack, don't rely on what we send you, we are in, in a risk uh, uh, situation. So how do we achieve this? We continuously monitor the state and identify the state of the plant and identify whether we are currently in a marginal state or not. Now we know that the marginal state is more like, most likely to be a result of a fault. However, at this point, we have no idea what type, what is the nature of the fault. It can be, or in most cases, it would be a benign natural fault. And then this will require us to apply some fault tolerance techniques. And just an example, we can execute two copies of the control task on two different processes or two different goals, and we'll see if they don't match. It means something is wrong. If they match, we can continue. But it might be that the cause of the, us being in a marginal state is a malicious attack. And then if the malicious attack is happening, running two copies of the same malicious code will not help us much. What we need to do is to use a different version of the control task that was sitting on a hard drive before and we hope that the hacker didn't hack the other one as well because it's not running at, at this point at all. Okay, so how will we do it? We will first assume it's benign fault because that's most of the time this would be the case. And what we'll do then, we'll duplicate the control task. If after this the state still remains marginal, what we'll do, we'll, we'll assume that this might be a malicious attack. So we will replace the current version of the control task by a second version. And what are the characteristics of the second version? It should follow a simpler control algorithm. So it will be necessarily more robust. It will have a shorter execution time, but lower quality. This would have the same quality of the original, we would run it instead. We, normally we run a more complicated, a more accurate and higher quality type of control task, but if we are under attack, we will replace it by a robust and a faster, but lower quality algorithm. And by the way, this is a not new technique, it has been used in the, in the past, to deal with the nine software bugs. If your software, for some reason, doesn't operate 
properly, you replace it by a simple version, and hopefully the simpler version we learn without uh, a bug. So, what happens if, even if after the second step, the planned state is still marginal, then we will execute emergency procedure, which will be unique to each type of physical system. There's not a single emergency procedure that will be applicable to all. And so, for example, we can use a default control, even an open loop uh, skip. If you are an airplane and you have, uh, you detect a malicious fault, don't start, don't start going down or going up. Stay the same elevation until uh, the pilot will take control and uh, hopefully will manage to handle the situation. And obviously, we will inform a remote operator, it can be a local operator or a remote operator, that we are in trouble. <coughs> but I wish to emphasize again that the most important part is to detecting a threat to, uh, as, to begin with. Okay, so the challenge is to determine whether we are, as the state is safe or marginal. And in, uh, and in principle, we can do it by having a huge table that tells us each state is it safe or marginal. But this will have, will bump into storage constraints, huge memory. And we can use a complicated algorithm to do the uh, determination, but this will take too much time, and this is a real time system we cannot afford to waste too much time on this classification. So we decided to use machine learning quickly techniques or scheme to identify the boundaries between the subspaces and hopefully we will require only a few parameters so the computation will be fast and will not slow us down. And we have experimented with several standard machine learning techniques, linear logistic regression, neural network, super support vector machine and a few more as we'll see later. So we will see Examples of how this works, we will start with the trivial one in the pendulum, then we'll go to the antelope waiting uh, system, highway platoon, uh, if time permits, uh, will cover the humanoid robot as well. So let's go back to our trivial pendulum, and here the real time control algorithm is used to determine the force and direction applied to the car here is a linear uh, quadratic regulator, LQR, that's a classical control algorithm. And as before, the constraints that we have here, should, the angle here should be between minus 0.5 to plus 0.5 radius. And we also have to identify to indicate what are the maximum powers that we can apply to the curve. It's between plus and minus 40 newton. So let's see what are the results. How does a safe space look like? So we, here we show how the S cubed is divided into S1, S2, and S3, where the coordinates here are the angle of the uh, pendulum and the derivative of the angle, the speed at which the angle changes. So the state of the pendulum is determined by those two parameters, the angle and the derivative of the angle. What is most important here to note is most of the space is occupied by S1, which is, which is a safe space. If you are an S1 and something in the control input is wrong, don't worry. It will very likely, next iteration will be fine and you will stay safe. But if you are in the SC, those are the marginal states, you have to apply immediately countermeasures because you don't want the system to become unsafe. But this clearly depends on the parameters of the system. If you take an extreme case and you lower the, max, the maximum current velocity almost to zero, it means you have maybe you are on a dirt road and there's a big friction here, it's hard to move the card. Then, as you can see, the size of S1 goes down drastically. Okay, let's see what are the classification algorithms that we have uh, experimented with uh, for this case. The uh, 
logistic regression neural net and SDM. So the logistic accuracy is only about 85%. That's not sufficient. So if we move the neural nets, we get to much higher accuracy, but we have to pay for it by using a much larger number, 10 times more parameters, which means the computation will be uh, more time consuming, but still within uh, risk. So let's switch now to a more interesting example, the antelope bike. And as we know, the objective of this is to prevent the wheels from locking up. So, and it turns out, and that's taken from the uh, literature, mechanical engineering literature, the most important parameter is what is known as the slip ratio, which is basically the ratio between the speed of the wheel to the speed of the car. If they don't match, you have a problem. So, uh, the, the way it behaves shown here, that's the friction force that you apply on the uh, wheels, on the tires, and this is a function of the slip ratio. As you can see here, the behavior is such that in this range, the friction force is the maximum. So you would like as much as possible to be in this neighborhood because this will lead to the smallest stopping distance before you hit somebody. So, uh, it turns out, as you can see here, that the largest friction force is achieved for a value of 0.15. So, what is the state vector in this example? It includes two coordinates. One is the vehicle speed, the other one is the wheel speed. What we use here is the, uh, the real-time control algorithm, the proportional integral derivative, or not, it's known as PID. And what are the requirements that we have to satisfy in order to be uh, to operate as efficiently as possible is to have the slip ratio between 0 0.05 and 0.25 somewhere around the optimal value of 0.15. So let's see how the space state space looks like. That's the entire state space as a function of the vehicle speed and the wheel speed. And after we uh, partition it to the individual subspaces, we will see that the green one, the safe space S1, is the largest one, and we have the marginal states on both sides. Still, this S1 consumes most of the total space, so most of the time will be safe, and we don't have to worry about either the nine folds or malicious folds. We use the same, we attempted to use the same three uh, machine learning algorithms, the uh, LR, NN, and SPM, and here we have a much better situation. All of them achieve a 100% precision or accuracy, which means we, are, we can use the one with the smallest number of parameters that we run much faster than the other ones. The next one is the platoon system or automated highway. And this is uh, more complicated than previous examples. For two is, first of all, it's we have multiple individual systems communicating with each other. And secondly, we will see that in a minute, we will switch from one control algorithm to the other. So, for those experiments, we will use the commercial software, Carlson, which is used normally by car manufacturers for automotive design, and it can simulate the automated highway as well. We have integrated into it as our software tool as well that classifies the states and might, uh, determines what to do in each of those uh, states. So let's see. Uh, uh, the experiments that we've done. We've done a leader, leader follower type of system. That's a leader, for example, that's a follower. And the leader can change erratically their speed. It can speed up, slow down, and the follower has no choice but to adjust the speed to make sure that the distance is still safe. And the exact distance is a function of the speed. Low speed, you can. Uh, 
be satisfied with a small distance, at a high speed you need a much bigger distance. So obviously the purpose is to ensure safety, not allow cars to collide. And the following car for that purpose uses a sensor to measure the distance from the leading one the car. And in addition, the leading car sends its speed wirelessly to the following car. All cars communicate and tell each other what speed they are going. <coughs> So let's see now what are the subspaces here. Here we have a three-dimensional uh, subspace. So the uh, coordinates are the leading car speed, the following car speed, and the distance between them. Here again you can see most of the volume is occupied by S1. Most of the time you will be safe and you don't have to worry about any type of volume. The only much smaller portion of the space has a marginal state. And those are two cross sections, again, just uh, illustrating the fact that most of the space is green, which is a safe space. Here we have two versions for the control uh, algorithm. Version one, the most complex one that you would prefer to run all the time is what is known as a constant type algorithm. And this gives you the adaptive boost of volume, which means it adjusts your speed according to the distance and according to the speed of the car in front of us. Very convenient for a driver. I have a car which uses it. It's very nice to have. And, uh, however, this is a very complex one complex software, which may, may have, hopefully it doesn't software, but more importantly, it, it's easier to hack into it and make uh, changes. Version 2, which is a simpler one, will be the PID as we mentioned before, but here we have a simpler algorithm that's a predetermined desired velocity of distance. You don't adjust uh, continuously your uh, velocity as in speed. So, and the distance between two cars is quality, is the quality of the control, obviously. Now, the version will switch from one to the other depending on the car and some space. If we are in a safe space, we use this one. If we are marginal, we switch to the other one. So, we used here the same, or we experiment with the same three algorithm. And here, as we've seen in the first example, the Logistic regression has a small number of parameters, but doesn't have provide doesn't provide sufficiently high accuracy. So we can switch to the neural net, which has almost 100 percent accuracy. The next slide is probably the most important slide in this presentation. If you recall, our algorithm was such: we will, if we are in a marginal state. We first assume that it's a benign form, and we apply some fault tolerance. We duplicate the task on two different uh, processors, and hopefully we'll be able to get out of this. But if this is a malicious fault, running the same faulty software, or same maliciously uh, modified software on two processors will not help us. Both of them will give us the same result. So, which means that the system would stay, still stay in a marginal state. So, we have to now to assume that this is probably a malicious form, and we need to do something about it. We need to replace the current control algorithm by another one, and this would take some time. And by so all this time passes and the system operates, and we might be in a situation that by the time we decide what to do, the system already crashed. So we have to be very careful in allowing and having time to allow us to do all those decisions before the state becomes unsafe. And how do we do this? We artificially reduce the size of S1, the very safe space. What does it mean? The safe space is determined by the frequency of the task. We've seen before, if you run at frequency 10 milliseconds, you have a big S1. If you run at frequency at 30 milliseconds, you have a small one. So we will artificially reduce the S1 by increasing the task period 
and only then we will declare this to be really safe. If it starts to go outside of S1, we will start to be concerned because it, soon we may be out of and uh, get to a real marginal state. So what we have here, what this figure shows, is the, the different colors shows what is the size of S1 for different task periods. So the task, the task period for this particular uh, highway system is 50 milliseconds. But we will define the innermost S1 for a much bigger task period of 400 milliseconds. And this is the green part here. If you increase the task period to 100, it's the blue one, the purple one is for 200, and the last one is 400. <laughs> so this means, oh, I'm sorry, the other way around. That's the 400, that's the 200, that's 100, and that's 50. So originally we considered all of this to be safe. Now we'll say, no, we want the innermost, only the green part, which stays safe even for 400. This is considered to be safe, and only here you do nothing. Once you get out of this, you are too close to a marginal state, and you might then take precautions, you might start your process. You first duplicate, and if it's still unsafe, you then replace the control algorithm and so on. So chances are you will still have time before it goes out all the way. And to make it clearer, let's look at this graph that shows how many steps are needed with the wrong control until you exit the innermost S1. And this is, will give you a, an idea how much time do you have to try all those different things steps that we mentioned before, before the system crashes. So as you can see here, that the community probability of leaving the uh, S1 for 50 milliseconds, when you start with the S1 in the innermost S1 for 400 milliseconds. And as you can see here, with a, well, let's ignore the different curves, you can see here that it takes about 20 steps before you are getting too close to a marginal state. Which means 20, roughly 20 cycles of 15 milliseconds each, that's the time you can have in order to find out that something went wrong, try duplication, and in this fails, replace it by another one, and then you are more likely to finish all those steps before the system really goes uh, out to a marginal state and you are in a risk of becoming unsafe. I'm probably running out of time. Okay, very good. So I have time to go through the last example. That's a humanoid robot which has uh, controls in uh, this, uh, at the ankle, at the knee and the hip and we have, can apply forces to each one individually. And this is a very trivial example. The only purpose in life of this robot is to stand straight. And due to environment and so on, the wind or whatever is being pushed right or left and we need to adjust its position. So we tried here a sick classification techniques, as you can see here, the logistic regression failed miserably, so we can include it here. So we have the neural net, random forest, the decision tree, two that we haven't seen before. The QC is about the same. But then we have another parameter that is of significance. How much time does it take to do the prediction? Or is it S1, S2, or S3? As you can see, there's a big difference. This takes three milliseconds, this takes one millisecond, and this takes a, a very small portion of a millisecond. Obviously, we would prefer the decision tree here because this would run faster and give us enough time to run the control task afterwards. And here too we'll see what happens, uh, how many steps 
it can be a fold before the, the state goes to the marginal state. As you can see here, we have about 10 steps before the probability of failure or probability of getting to a marginal state, I should say, gets into 0 0.01. So hopefully this will allow us enough time to go through the steps of the algorithm and make sure that the system doesn't uh, deteriorate. So this brings me to the conclusion what hopefully we have I convince you into the, uh, regarding the benefits of continuously monitoring the current state of the physical plan. We can, this allows us to achieve higher reliability at the lower cost. We will apply high redundancy only when it's absolutely needed. We will detect malicious attacks that are targeting the physical plan rather than attempt to access proprietary information. There are already techniques for this purpose, all kinds of uh, cryptography-based technique, so we don't uh, modify those. We focus on those that target the physical system because those are the dangerous ones in the CPS. And we allow recovery from some malicious attacks, we cannot guarantee all of them, but the most important one, as I mentioned before, we can always detect and invoke some emergency response. And for that purpose, uh, we must have an official technique to classify the subspace in real time, which means that we'll have to go through a large number of uh, machine learning techniques to find out uh, one that does the best. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.